Welcome to my talk about the public domain project. Stream. Yeah, good, good. Okay. Um, my name is Christoph Zimmermann. I'm from Switzerland and I'm in the public domain project. I'm uh, the server administrator and mainly the guy for all technical questions computer related or any other technology involved and um, the public domain project essentially is about collecting and digitizing music and bring them to all the interested people uh, who are interested in uh, in music and, and um, in a way, for us, it is very natural to do that. And in the Linux and open source community, it's very natural idea to do that. But unfortunately, in the professional world of archives and libraries, it, it should be a usual way of thinking and the normal thing they do in their everyday, everyday job. But unfortunately, it's not that um, great at the moment the situation so we try to help in this situation and go forward with a good example how we think a modern archive or, or library should work and should step um, a leap forward to the users so yeah as I said we are focused on um, digitizing music, so our intended audience are of course music listeners, music historians, academic world that is interested in uh, interpretation history, but of course all private people collecting music interested in uh, listening to music or uh, of course in, uh, in the case here at the Linux Audio Conference where we have a lot of uh, active Musicians, they are also interested in music they can freely use for their own works as a base for to get samples from it or as a uh, as models to uh, uh, to model physical correct uh, virtual instruments out of very old. Uh, instruments where you only have old recordings as as a reference to uh, as a basis for your model for example and there are of course a lot of other use cases where you can use music that is freely available and usable in the internet like uh, just simple background music in some uh, holiday movies and all that kind of stuff that's otherwise gets somehow deleted also by or People cannot watch it because they see these little warning signs that says, yeah, you are not allowed to see this in this country. You can easily avoid that when you use, for example, music from our platform or uh, other platforms that provide free to use music. So this brings me, um, unfortunately, to, to a more... Uh, uh, heuristical side of my talk, I have to talk about what does free actually mean in this context. Um, when I mean free, I speak about free as in freedom. And in this sense, we have to talk about uh, the copyright laws that are uh, in, in, in power in, in a lot of countries. And we work, uh, talk about works, general term about it in the copyright law is always a work and it means any creative thing. So we, we don't have uh, different rules for, for images or paintings or music uh, productions. And the, all of them is, is a work. And the work, a creative work is automatically under the copyright law and you gain some uh, monopole for, some, for a certain time and after a certain time you're, you, 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 you as a, a creative person you, you, you lose your rights on, on your work. Uh, that's, that's true in all 
uh, copyright laws that are in, in force at the moment that at some time in the future you, you, you lose your, your rights. And when this time frame exp uh, ex is exhausted, your work enters the so-called public domain. That, that's the correct uh, legal meaning of the public domain. It's in that case, uh, in that saying, the opposite of copyright. When it is public domain, it cannot be in the copyright. And as I said, copyright is in, in every country time limited. And for the German speaking people or from a uh, German-speaking areas uh, in the, uh, the correct, the legally correct term uh, in German would be gemeinfrei. Very seldom known word, but that's that's the correct term for it. So when I say um, different copyright laws, uh, what you should remember of this picture that it is colorful. Um, Every color stands for a certain um, set of rules that apply to copyright terms. I, I only speak now uh, about how long a certain work is protected under in these countries. And, and as you see, every color means a different time frame the, the copyright law is in force. So this makes it for us quite complicated uh, to, to make sure that the works we digitize and, and upload, they are really free to use. But it should be our job to do this complicated work, so you should not care about yourself. You should come to our platform and be sure, yeah, I download that and use it. So that's more... Um, in that sense, more more uh, background information. How we, um, what we have to do our work in the background. And as I said, I'm from Switzerland, so also our servers are located in Switzerland, and that means that we have to follow the Swiss rules, and that means uh, at the moment that we have to wait. Uh, 70 years after the death of, of all the authors of a certain work until we can release it and together also 50 years after the first publication of a certain work. Uh, of course it would be also possible that uh, copyright holders um, give the license to us that we can freely use it. So, uh, for example, the CC BY or the public domain license from the Cre uh, Creative Commons framework would, would be suitable when an author applies that license to, to a certain work, then we would be very happy to, to include it in, in, our, uh, in our archive. So, here a short example how it uh, looks like what what we have to what kind of information we have to get from a certain work uh, to make sure that it is freely usable. I chosen here the uh, uh, everybody knows the the song happy happy birthday to you. Please don't sing it. I explain now why. Um, to know the copyright status of, of this work, you have to know for the copyright itself who has written it. And in this case, um, the melody of this track was written by, uh, by two sisters, uh, Patty Hill and Mildred J. Hill. And after they wrote the melody for, for different a completely different kind of song. It was used together with different lyrics for the Happy Birthday song. So for the melody itself, it's only uh, interested when Patty Hill and Mil Mildred Hill died. Um, in this case, we have two co-authors, so it means that we have to wait 70 years after the death of the longest living author. So in this case it was Patty Hill and she died in 1946. So that means in the 
in Switzerland and the European Union, the copyright of this track will expire on the 1st January of 2017. So please don't sing that song yet because you still have to pay royalties for that. Uh, even if I have my birthday today, I still ask, don't sing. <laughs> then in the copyright law, you have also the so-called neighboring rights. These are all the rights uh, concerning the, the labels and the uh, manufacturers of the, of the records. And for this, we have to know when the work was first published. Um, this story is, for this example, more, more complicated. Uh, because no one knows for sure when the first version with this melody and the changed lyrics uh, really appeared the first time. It, the historians say it is sure that it was released before 1911, so that's, that's fine for us in the, uh, in the European Union. The story in the United States is very complicated. They changed a lot their, their rules in, uh, in the field of copyright law. And as it is a very popular song and also economically interesting, it, it went to court to, to decide to see for sure how, how the status of this, uh, this work is. And the good news is it's also expired in the United States. So. Uh, at 1st of January, in, uh, in, uh, New Year's Eve, the next time, start singing right after the uh, after midnight. Would be a, a good joke to do and to explain other people why you're singing it and celebrate that this great folk song we all know and it for a lot of us it is important that it is finally in the public domain at at the next. New Year's Eve. So, so I will come back to, to our project. Uh, what we are doing uh, first, some uh, some facts. What we we achieved in the last years. Uh, we talked to a few co uh, record collectors and already gained about fifty thousand physical records. So I don't ask a lot of collectors anymore because it's a, uh, it's a, a bit a hurdle to, to handle so many records already in a small uh, in a quite small project um, we have only one statistics from Wikimedia Commons for one month but it was quite impressive what we got back from from Wikimedia that we have around 40,000 downloads in Wikimedia Commons each month um, for just only around 900 files that we have uploaded to common. So that's, that's a really nice, nice achievement. In the end, yeah, we are around 8 to 15 active or more or less active people. So um, this is the entry page of our, our project uh, where you can see what um, parts um, our project consists of. Uh, of course, we have the, um, the the main part where you can download our stuff and browse through our files. And then we have all the online radio station where we use our own digitized music to, to make radio channels out of it. And then we have different language versions of, of our wiki where we try to collect information about uh, um, uh, artists, musicians, uh, lyricists, um, uh, conductors, and all that stuff that we need for ourselves to to provide. And there it is. The uh, in the background of the project, there is a, a non-profit uh, foundation that we have based in Switzerland. Yeah. Now, going a bit deep on the technical stuff, I mean, I'm here at the Linux Audio Conference, I have to talk about technical stuff, not, not legal stuff. Uh, and I go shortly through our digitizing process, how, how we do it at the moment. And you see a quite new photo of our current office in Zurich, uh, where we have a nice sponsor that gives us place we can use. Um, first, we clean our our records and then we digitize them with a laser turntable. 
come back in detail to, to these steps afterwards. Then we export that stuff as flock files and then we do the complicated copyright investigations and then we upload it to, uh, to our own platform and to Wikimedia Commons. Uh, here you have see two examples why you should clean your records especially when they are 80 years old or 90 years old, stored in unknown places. So, uh, yeah, we clean our records with the Keith Monk's record cleaning machine. It was purpose-built for archival use, so we can also uh, clean records that are bigger in size than 12 inches, for example, which are, uh, have been used in radio studios. Then when we have proper clean records, we use our um, Japanese laser turntable to digitize them, uh, if it is possible. Uh, it is a great uh, machine with a great uh, output resolution and, and it's really handy to work with, but it has some certain limitations for some certain special old records. Uh, for example, there are you have uh, single-sided Edison discs, very thick and only single-sided, and you cannot digitize them with our laser turntable because of the thickness. The laser is just unable to focus on this on these records. Uh, another problem would be a colorful disc. It's only able to to digitize uh, black records. Uh, no, so no picture discs, and yes. Also on Shellac records, you have picture discs. It was, it was already invented in, in, in the 30s, 40s, something. It is a great uh, machine. We, we are very proud to have one, and we are still proud that Wikimedia Germany uh, bought us one of these machines. Um, as I said, we digitize all our stuff in loss lossless FLUG files, and uh, we shoot with cannons to, to small. Uh, to, to little birds uh, by digitizing 80-year-old records with 24 bits and 192 kilohertz just to have as much information out of this, these old records and see what we can do with this, this detailed information. And then as I said and explained, then we are doing the, the copyright investigation and during this step we also add all the... Um, the nice to know metadata to, to our files. Like, uh, yeah, of course, on, on the record itself, you can see who, who was the writer of this song, but uh, a lot of time the lyricist is missing and you don't know the release date. And you would like to know on a live performance where it was, um, where it was first played. So we gather all this information to together. And yeah, that's one example how it looks like in the end in our wiki front end uh, where you see what what kind of information we, we collect on our information. You also see that we make pictures of the of the labels of the records so you can also browse, browse through these. And here the important information uh, you see for different areas how the copyright status is. And as you see in the international area, there are some countries with longer uh, protection uh, time frames. So. But this is a pretty good example you can use more or less uh, all over the world. So, yeah, and then we upload it to our own uh, uh, storage servers, which are also located in Zurich. Uh, with a great sponsor, and we also upload it to Wikimedia Commons. So, if you are used to search for your music or samples on Wikimedia Commons, you are probably uh, find also our stuff there. Yeah, and I attend, of course, the Linux Audio Conference because we use a lot of open source and. A project like us wouldn't be po uh, wouldn't had any chance to be possible without all the great open source that's that's outside. So that's also one reason I'm here to thank you if you are 
involved in any coding, in any documentation, in any project that helps us and the others. And yeah, and also to, to say uh, again that that I'm doing a great project. I'm very, very happy what I'm doing, but I couldn't have done all of this without this help of thousands of other people. So what kind of uh, open source we use on a daily basis? So as I said, we use MediaWiki as a front end, so more or less, uh, and to organize a lot of stuff. And then we have all the, the yeah, a lot of stuff you, you know, and then we have a lot of server systems. You also know Apache and statistical stuff and all the virtual machine management stuff. And, and it all runs really, really great. I mean, we, we have 2016 and you really can rely on that on your, on your daily work on highly loaded sites. And it wouldn't be possible without, uh, without all this, this background stuff. I mean, a GCC, it's... I don't know if anybody here is able to, <laughs> to to write a compiler by himself, but we all need one, so thanks for that. Then, as I said, that's the more interesting part for, for you audio guys here. Uh, we run our own online radio stations. Of course, we use also free free and open source in this uh, for this purpose. Uh, just a sh uh, short diagram how online radio works. If you don't know that already, I think so. A lot of you, a lot of you will do. Uh, you have somewhere a studio a source. Nowadays, it's, it don't have to be a, a studio anymore. This source creates one stream with the music you would like to distribute to your users. Then you have the the streaming server, which is actually uh, handling all the user requests. The internet radio stream itself will be multiplied for each user, so it's a simple, uh, um, it's just a multi, uh, not multicast, it's a sim unicast uh, system. It's not multicast and not broadcast, so uh, online radio needs a lot of bandwidth compared to what it should use if you could be able to use multicast in a local local network. But that's not the problem anymore nowadays where we have yeah belief in the time of video streaming, so online radios are getting very cheap now. So that's how the system works. Uh, in our case, in the background, uh, we use for, um, for the streaming servers, we use Icecast 2, a very well-known project, quite old also nowadays, but it's running uh, very solid. You have uptimes of two years with this project without any problems. We also provide still uh, streams to Shoutcast servers because it's still the most popular radio platform to, uh, to attract users. And we provide our streams in open formats like Orkwarbis and then also in the common user known formats like MP3 and AAC+, but of course we always use open source encoders for these proprietary formats. And to generate the whole stream and automate what music is played, we use uh, Liquid Soap. Uh, that's a very great project from France written in OCaml. And it's kind of scripting language to do audio manipulation. So uh, for you, it's very common to think in, in data streams like you have in, uh, in PD or Faust. And the Liquid Soap has the same approach how you, how, how you handle audio streams. You have somewhere inputs, you can read files or read uh, network streams and you manipulate them, you add metadata to it, you mix them, you make crossfades or whatever in, in modules and then you uh, plug it into some outputs and the outputs in our case are of course these streaming servers where we feed our audio stream to, to the Icecast servers in where we select uh, the encoding that should be used and stuff like that. Uh, pretty handy, it has also some, um, uh, you can use the old Lutzbar plugins with it for example. and 
in the meantime, Liquid Soap is also a very stable, rock solid project. So, yeah, the last time my server crashed was because the some log files filled my hard drives, and then after three quarter of years, it my server just stopped running, and that's that was the only problem I had during one year of so administration with the online radio. And then we also have uh, HTML5 frontend for the radio now. That's also great, uh, based on the open source uh, JPlayer. Works also really well. Then inside the office, we also have uh, computers to digitize our stuff. Uh, these workstations are also filled uh, with, with open source software, of course. Unfortunately, because of some missing drivers for proper high-end audio gear, uh, we have to run it on the Windows. I don't like that part, but I have to mention it. <laughs> but that's always the, the case when you are using long time open source, you know it's all coming down to, to drivers and support of manufacturers for developers who would like to write drivers. So it's in, in the audio world, I think it's, it's still needed that we go to manufacturers of our beloved gear to, to punch them again and punch them every year, if we forget it, that they should open at least their specs. So, yeah, that's about the project and the, the technical background with it. Um, I give some small outlook what we are trying to, to achieve in the, in the next... Uh, in the near and midterm future, the midterm future is um, mainly to to extend our community and to extend our reach. Reach is also by means of of countries. Uh, we only have an office now in in Zurich, where we have a core group dedicating their their time for, to digitizing stuff. Of course, that's only focused in, in records that we have here in Central Europe. So we, co we are collaborating with a project in, in Uruguay. Uh, they don't have the recording equipment yet, but they are gaining people and are building up the, the, the needed information about authors from Latin America. So they already know the copyright status of, of the stuff when they will start work on, on digitization. That's really good thing the what they do um, we are still wanting of course an archive with control climate for our records uh, we, we move them at the moment every half a year a year because our, we we get a new sponsor or we need a new room for it that's uh, a quite bad situation for the for the archive and the more short term uh, goals are, of course, get funding. It's a volunteer community-based project with fixed costs every month, so we have to always be up to uh, try to get, get money for that. And then we have also the, uh, a lot of technical stuff that's not solved yet. Uh, as I said, we are using MediaWiki, so uh, yeah, how do you work in media wiki it's all done by hand you have to write your own links you nothing is automated at the moment um, and this has to change of course because of quality stuff and nobody has time to do all manual labor work we would like to make that uh, um, we would like oh, we all of us would like to have a, a automated workflow as most as as we can go and also on the server backend side, uh, it's at the moment only a, a simple uh, file storage without any project protection measurements against long time failures like, like BitRot or people changing files by accident and stuff. So uh, we, we need to do a lot of groundwork on, on the, uh, in the background to have a, a fault tolerant storage system that uh, these last two parts, these are, uh, um, as I'm the technical guy, I uh, haven't found any any people in um, 
fixing these problems for me, so I have to do it myself. So during this year, I'm I'm more or less working full time on this kind of stuff in the uh, in our project. And yeah, the other part uh, is also to uh, go more out from our project that our uh, files and our metadata that we generate is more usable for other projects or more usable by other means that um, so we have to improve our output from from the media wiki that is at the moment optimized to read by humans to be also readable by machines so uh, search machines can find our stuff better that we can uh, include our metadata that we generate, for example, in free music databases like Music Brains. It's very important to bring our research we do in, in op open databases. I, I talked to the Music Brains guys the, uh, so, some weeks ago. Uh, if they are interested in recording information on these old records and they said, yeah, for sure, but we only have a few uh, users who have access to this record, so yeah, we are very happy to uh, to get that information into. And the other part is, for example, Europeana. Uh, it's a great project. It's a, a, a meta library of all the European cult cultural content. So a lot of museums and archives are feeding in their catalogs into Europeana. So you have one. Uh, platform where you can search for, for interesting paintings, musical recordings all, all over Europe. All right. So it would be for us really great to be also included in, in this huge catalog. Yeah, that brings me more or less uh, to the end of, of, the, of the talk. Uh, of course, we are a volunteer-based project. We need a lot of volunteers. <laughs> As a lot of other projects in this room, I guess. Uh, I would like to thank our, our partners that uh, support us for several years now in, in different areas, uh, in technical areas, financial, or also in, in uh, political areas where we, are, where we need also help to protect um, the rules at least on the level we are now or hopefully getting a bit a bit better but still to defend the line where we have where we sit now on the on the copyright discussion then our uh, sponsors who make this possible and yeah that's mainly what i would like to uh, explain about the project and hopefully we still have some time for questions also beside of the technical problems we had at the beginning but yeah so Uh, yeah, you mentioned the, the uh, image uh, discs, uh, Shellac image, image discs, or, or video discs, or something Picture like that. Picture discs. Picture discs. What yeah. is that? Uh, when you have a record that that's not black, but it has a nice uh, cover art beneath the the, uh, the surface of the of the record. So, how does this project relate to archive.org and who also like publish a lot of public domain content? Yeah. Um, archive.org has, has a lot of similarities what we are doing. Uh, we try to work together with them because they share a lot of the, the same ideas and, and why not going the same direction together? Um, what I saw on, on archive.org that is, in my opinion, a, a bit problematic is that they don't have any means of, of quality control or review process at the, at the beginning. So you can have a lot of MP3 format files on archive.org. In my opinion, very problematic. 
Then you have a lot of files with, with, uh, with only file names as information uh, and, and no uh, entries in the meta tags of the file. So there are more technical points I, I have to discuss with, this, uh, uh, with the people from archive.org in direct, but I'm, I'm really happy what they are doing and they also have their own digitizing equipment and offices for that and training people and, and that's really great to see, yeah. I'd be interested in, um, I don't know the English terms for it, but um, there's the Urheberrecht and the Leistungsschutzrecht. And for instance, if, if, a, if an author of a recording is dead for, I don't know, 70 years or something and it's copyright free, yeah. what about a recording that has been done in recently uh, by someone who had actually paid for it, so for the Leistungsschutzrechte, which then appear? No. Yeah. Then it is still protected in the sense that you are not able you are not allowed to use it for for any uh, commercial use. So it means you, you are not allowed to remix it, you are not allowed to, to stream it in an online radio without a license. So do you have to, uh, to differ between these two a lot or is it just... If it's an yeah, old we, recording um, that... It's especially with classical music, uh, it's the... It's the normal daily case that you have to know all of these things and then it, yeah, I mean Beethoven is very old, very famous and we can only provide online the, all the recordings that were made before 1966 in Switzerland, in the European Union and that means in Wikimedia Commons we can only provide 70, 70 years after the first release, so you have to go, to go back even 20 years earlier. So it's the same time ranges for the copyright and the Leistungsschutzrecht? Um, Normally? No, because the neighboring rights, they start with the first publication. And the time frame for the copyright starts with the death of the oldest author. They okay. can, can be very different for, for different examples. I saw in the world map, you saw there was a color for a country for, which has no copyright. And I would like <laughs> to know which one is this. Yeah, let's see. There it is. Uh, well, I saw it. Uh, no copyright and unknown. South of Chile also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that should be uh, uh, for your land. I think that's just the coast. <laughs> but yeah, I, I looked that up once. Uh, no, Sudan will be the. Is, is bigger. <laughs> yeah, that's also possible. But uh, where it is there? You have your example up there, um, east of Afghanistan. Can you see it? There you have your example. Uh, close to an unknown. So in Afghanistan, it's unknown. It was unknown. I mean, when was this? Map made it. It's already some years old. It's around 2010 or so, I think. I, think so. I don't know if the in Afghanistan changed anything in um, in the area of copyright or if they still try to fix other pro more important problems there. Um, you mentioned you, you first do the physical work of digitizing and all that stuff, and then you start researching the copyright. Why? I would expect the other way around. <laughs> or, um, at the moment, we have no catalog of our collection. So at the moment, it's really taking out a box and open it and looking what's inside. And 
my my good friend who is doing all the uh, historical research stuff he looks through and selects highly probable candidates to digitize so he he uses his uh, acquired knowledge to select which ones to digitize but it is possible that in the detailed research you find out yeah the uh, there is on this specific track an additional lyricist and this one makes it uh, non-public domain so we we have this where the front side is is on our servers and the back side we we have to uh, kept in in our place until some uh, 10 years or so and we also do it this way because the copyright investigation is uh, very time consuming. So um, digitizing, I don't care about building robots, putting records on the record cleaning machine and then afterwards directly to a laser player and stuff like that. I, I get this question quite often, how, why I don't build robots and automate these kind of things for this huge amount of 50,000 records. I, I mean, I un really understand this question, but in the end, Digitizing a record takes half an hour or so, including cleaning both sides and uh, all the work in Audacity. But you're really, really lucky if you are done with your copyright investigation after half an hour. <laughs> so there should be the place to automate stuff. <laughs> Uh, speaking up, uh, are there any any databases that kind of keep track on on uh, well the things that are unknown for you? Do you have like a really good go-to place basically for yourself uh, if you try and digitize a record and you're like, oh okay, um, I have to find out if this is uh, under some sort of copyright in some country or my country or whatever. Um, do you do you I don't know? Is there something like uh, Music Brains, for instance, for uh, for this kind of stuff? Yeah. There are several places you can go, uh, most of them academic. So my friend is, um, uh, is heavily using the Charm project of, of a university in the UK that catalogs their own collection and this collection is so huge that it has a lot of interesting information in it for us. Um, and of course it it has gaps for, for our use cases. So, um, if we can, we use Wikipedia plus plus the other references that were used uh, that are used on Wikipedia, and we also have a big shelf of uh, that would to to have a known library of reference books out of this time. So there are modern. Uh, collections like the um, Musik in Geschichte und Gegenwart, the Music Encyclopedia in, in 20 uh, books. Uh, we have that, for example, but we also have very specialized books on label X, Y, Z from the, that existed only up to 1940 and was bought afterwards. And there is a catalog of all matrix numbers that were released by these labels, including the release date, the first release date. The first release date is uh, a lot of time the most complex uh, information you to, to get because it's not written on the record and not a lot of people are interested in it. So it's most of the time these this books with list of matrix numbers, they are most of the time bought by archivists and, and collectors. Collectors who would like to know, okay, these numbers I have, this one is missing. I have to search this one. So, But uh, these books are very helpful for us. But also uh, that's bit of problem for us because we need money to buy these, bo these specialized books in uh, sometimes out of print, sometimes very expensive. And um, there are digital versions of these encyclopedias, but, uh, but they are very expensive to, to have licenses with it. But that 
it's the other story uh, I told, yeah, we try to make our structural data usable for other projects. So we have these books now, so we should try to reuse that that information in a in a more open, more usable sense for, for developers and, and and academics. And because it, uh, isn't it copyright on those books then as well? On the books you have copyright, uh, you don't have copyright on facts. So these parts of the books that are just facts we are free to, to reuse. Uh, I at least in Switzerland, I have to uh, limit this sentence here in Germany because you uh, have here in Germany a so-called database law, uh, database right. And but uh, don't ask me for details about that. We don't have that in Switzerland. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>